In this lesson, we are going to start going over code in a new file. Inside Atom, let's open up one of the example projects in the BP Synth Code folder. The file we're wanting to open up is Basic Saw. The Basic Saw project will eventually be used to create a simple digital sawtooth oscillator and drive the digital analog converter with it to make a simple tone. But for now, we are going to focus only on how the digital audio stream is created. Looking into Core, Source, Main.C, and scrolling down to MX I2S1 Init, we're looking at parameters for initializing the I2S1 peripheral. When we configured our project with CubeMX, it created these parameter settings for us. I want to bring to attention the parameter I2S audio frequency 32K. This will be the sample rate, 32,000 samples per second per channel, left and right channels. We have options to change the rate if we so desire. These are other sample rates we might have chosen when configuring the microcontroller with CubeMX. I2S audio frequency 192K, 96K, 48K, 44K, 32K, 22K, 16K, 11K, and 8K. We can quickly change the sample rate by changing this parameter using the macros that CubeMX would have placed in for us if we had chosen them. So if we wanted 44 kilohertz, we would use I2S audio frequency 44K. We are using I2S audio frequency 32K, which is 32 kilohertz, which I mentioned prior is going to balance well for quality of sound without placing too much strain on the microcontroller. Whenever we change the I2S audio frequency, there is another macro we must change when we change sample rates. Let's open up BP Basic Saw, Core, Init, Constants H. I'm going to go ahead and split this to the right. Inside this file, you will find Sample Rate, and you will see it's defined as 32,000. If you were to change the sample rate to 44K, then you would have to change Sample Rate in Constants to 44,000 as well. We will return to sample rate again later on when we discuss the phase incrementing oscillator. This macro is very important for the oscillators to work correctly. We went over most of the following parameters when we configured the microcontroller with the CubeMX tool, but we can quickly go over them and a few others briefly here. Instance SPI1 is basically we're going to use the SPI1 peripheral to create our I2S interface. Init mode I2S mode master transmit. This parameter indicates that we are defining this I2S as a master transmit I2S mode. The I2S standard Phillips is a mode or format that we are following. I2S format 16B, this indicates the bitrate for the above mode that we are using. I2S master clock output disable. Since we're using the I2S standard Phillips mode, we do not need the master clock output, so we are disabling it. We've already gone over I2S audio frequency. I2S clock polarity low is the standard to be used with I2S standard Phillips mode. I2S clocked phase lock loop is our clock source for our I2S signals. And we saw this at the bottom of the clock configuration screen when we were configuring the microcontroller. I2S full duplex disable. What this means is we're essentially using this only in transmit mode. If this were full duplex mode, it would not only be transmitting, it would be receiving as well. Looking again at our simple diagram of the I2S signals, the BCK line is a clock source. It will keep everything in sync. DIN is the streaming bits of data, and LCK is the left-right clock. If the signal is high, it is receiving right channel bits. If the signal is low, it will be receiving left channel bits. When we are running at 32 kilohertz sample rate, we are going to see a 32 kilohertz square wave at the LCK pin. 
One full cycle of the square waveform is one high and one low state before it goes back to high again. So 32,000 times per second is high and 32,000 times per second it's low. While the LCK is high, 16 bits of data will be received via the DIN pin. Then the LCK pin will change to low and another 16 bits of data will be received on the DIN pin. Getting back to the BCK and DIN pins, we can estimate the BCK clock rate by multiplying 32 bits times 32,000 cycles per second which gives us a clock speed of around 1.024 megahertz. And when we look at BCK on a scope, we can see that's almost exactly what speed it's running. The DIN pins will not be a steady repeat of cycles when data is streaming in, but the scope may try to register somewhere near the 200 kilohertz range with 32 kilohertz sample rate data, as you can see here. The reason why we are going over this again with a bit more detail is because we're about to see how this all comes together with using the circular buffer we took a look at in a prior lesson. Recall in a prior lesson the circular buffer which is an array of numbers that the microcontroller's core will quickly store values to while the DMA streams out those values at a much slower rate than what the core wrote them. We update half the buffer while the DMA reads out the other half. When the DMA reaches the middle of the buffer, it will trigger a function call to have the core fill in the first half of the array while the DMA continues to stream out the second half. When it reaches the end of the buffer, it will again trigger a function to call to have the core fill in the last half of the buffer while the DMA goes back to the beginning to read the first half again. Let's head back to BasicSaw's main.c. When we scroll down we'll come to a section called user code begin PV which stands for user code begin private variables. In here we defined an array called audio buff and we gave it the length of buff len. Now, to find the value of buff len, we need to go back to the constants h folder that we saw the sample rate in. If we pull down a little bit here, we'll find buff len. And over here on the right, it's defined as 4 times buff len division 4. So what is buff len division 4? It's right here. Buff len division 4, and it equals 500. So buff len is 4 times 500. 500. Audio buff is our circular buffer and it's been casted as 16-bit values inside the buffer. So inside the array there are 2,000 values that are 16-bit each. Now let's scroll down to int main void. Scroll a little bit further down and you will find how i2s transmit DMA. This is our kickstart of the DMA stream. Once we call this function, the DMA will begin to read the buffer and stream out the values to the DIN pin on the digital analog converter. As you can see in the arguments, we're going to use the HI2S1 handler. Our buffing starting address is at address of audio buff 0. And the length of the buffer is buff len which is 2,000 elements long. This is how the handler will know how long the buffer is and from that information it knows where the halfway and endpoints of the buffer are. The handler simply divides the length by 2. So 2,000 divided by 2 equals 1,000. And to know what memory address is halfway through the buffer you do audio buff plus 1,000 to know where that address is. And to find the end of the buffer, audio buff plus 2000. Looking back again at our circular buffer, you will recall we have a transfer half complete and a transfer complete interrupt. 
These are called when the DMA reaches the halfway point or the end point of the audio buffer. For now, we're going to act like there are actually 2,000 elements inside of this array instead of just six. It's easier to see and explain things with just a handful of elements versus trying to show all 2,000 of them. The very first time DMA streams out data from AudioBuff, it will begin to stream out null values because we have not written any values in there yet. When it reaches the 1,000th element, HAL I2S transfer half complete callback will get called. Let's go take a look at that now. Back in main.c, near the top, in private user code, user code begin 0, we find HAL I2S transfer complete callback. This is the function that gets called when we reach the halfway point in our buffer. What this function does is it calls another function called make sound with arguments audio buff and buff len division 4. Now looking over at constants, buff len division 4 equals 500. Now you may say to yourself, well, the halfway point was 1,000 elements. Why are we using 500? When we go take a look at the make sound function, it will start to become clear why. So in order to find make sound, we need to open up another file called wavegen.c. And I'm going to move this over here. And here's the function call. And here's the actual function. So audio buff is placed where buff is at. And buff length division 4 is placed in where length is at. Buff is a pointer to the memory location of our circular buffer, audio buff. Length is how many times we will calculate samples. In this case, length equals 500. But we will actually do twice as many samples as indicated by length, one each for left and right channels, as we will soon see. Inside make sound, we see we define a few variables. We have POS, which is short for position, we have a pointer called out p, which we're going to use to point to the memory locations while we write to them. We have float y, which is our actual sample that we're generating. We have float y left and y right, which will allow us to create left and right samples. And then finally, we have value left, value right, which is our final value we convert from yl and yr float values to integer 16 values so that we can store them in audio buff. More on this in a later lesson. When we call make sound to process our samples, the first thing it will do is assign out p the value of buf. Remember we're running this call back at the moment as make sound audio buff buff len 4. And the definition of the function is make sound buff length. Buff in this instance is the memory location of the first element in the audio buff array. So when we defined out p equals buf, we just copy the value of buf, which in this instance is the memory address at audio buff 0, into output p, a pointer variable. Please be aware that buff's value will change when we call this function again at the end of the buffer as we will soon see. Moving down, we see F0 equals 200. This is the frequency of our waveform. But what we're really after right now is the for loop. For POS equals 0, as long as POS is less than the length, which is 500. And every time we return to this point, increment POS plus 1. So what for loops do is they run all of this code, and then it comes back up here and it checks to see if POS has exceeded the value of length. If it hasn't, it increases POS plus 1, runs it again, and it just keeps repeating this until POS is greater than length. We will return to see what happens inside the loop later, but for now I want to jump to the end of this for loop and point out out p plus plus equals value left, out p plus plus equals value right. Here we see how we get two samples for each loop we run. 
Thus, we run the loop 500 times, but we get 1,000 samples. Out P begins in this case pointing at the very beginning of audio buff. When it reaches the first incrementer, out P++ equals value L, it will change the memory address we store the value into after it is stored. So value L gets stored in audio buff 0, then out P changes to point to audio buff 1. Next, value R gets stored in audio buff 1, and out P is incremented again and now points to audio buff 2, which is where we will be when we start the next loop. Now let's conclude the second half of the DMA stream. Going back to main.c, we see another I2S transfer callback. This is the transfer complete callback, but the arguments have changed a bit. Instead of just audio buff, now we have audio buff plus buff len divided by 2. Now if we go over here to constants and take a look at buff len divided by 2, we see that it is 2 times buff len divided by 4. And since we know buff len divided by 4 is 500, we can just take 2 times 500 and come up with 1000. This will be the halfway point inside the audio buffer. Notice our length still stays at buff len divided by 4, which is 500. So now when we go back to our make sound function, our buff pointer here will actually be audio buff plus 1000, or simply put, audio buff 1000. This time around, we will begin writing data at this point in the buffer instead of at the very beginning like we did the first time we ran make sound. And again, we will assign the memory address that buff points to to out p at out p equals buff. And we move on to our for loop like before. And at the end, we fill the buffer up by incrementing out p twice each time we go through the loop. When it reaches the end of the loop, we wait for the DMA to reach the halfway complete point again, and we start this process all over again. This is how we achieve our data stream, and it is the foundation of how our synthesizer makes sound. In the next lecture, we will learn how to create a sawtooth wave sample by sample.